David Hilton in the house. David, would you stand? Stand up, stand up up there. The most authentic cowboy pastor I know. I've known David a long time. Cried with him, laughed with him, rode with him. Um, and to have him here. And, he, and it's, it's not about having the fastest growing church anywhere. I've already been down that road. And I know that, that they can get you in a little bit of trouble at times. But having a church that people love one another Amen. is Dayton Christian Center. And I thank God for what's happening in Pastor David's life and his family and his kids. And I've watched them grow and go. And it's just been a blessing. Amen. Pastor Richard Amador, would you stand up? We're so glad to have Pastor Richard Amador in the house. Speaking of fast-growing churches, Pastor Richard and I built one of the fastest-growing churches without a cell phone. <laughs> Never had a cell phone. Closest thing we had was a pager and the word of mouth and folk talking. That's why I'm saying get off at Facebook and start telling people about Jesus. Get them to church. Richard, good to have you guys here, man. Been, watched you grow up as a puppy, man. You, you growed up. Randy Hawkins uh, preached for Randy over 30 years ago in Zachary, Louisiana. Now he's preaching in a church in south of Oklahoma, a cowboy church there. Uh, I have so much love for this man. Randy and I, I, I if, you, if you'll talk with him after church, it's like the bayou just spilt out of his mouth. <laughs> Amen. And he's my agitator. He's a strong LSU fan, strong. Mm, yeah, we got a few in the house. And uh, I ain't got to say nothing about H where we from, huh? A 18 national champions. Would y'all welcome Randy Hawkins. Pastor Randy, would you stand? Glad to have you here. I'm blessed to have how these guys show up. Pastor Armando, pastors near is it near Aldine? Uh, uh, near the airport. Near the airport. Amen. So all the flyovers over there. But uh, Armando uh, had uh, a little deficit in his health. Amen. A few months back, we prayed for him. Now he's doing well. He looks like doing real well. <laughs> I love him. I spent time with him in Oklahoma City too. He's a dear friend, of Pastor Rick. So I'm glad you came tonight, sir. We want to honor you if you wouldn't mind standing, so we can tell you we love you. Again, speaking from somebody that was so young so long ago, Josh, I watched you grow. Uh, you're a preaching machine now. Uh, you know about every facet there is. I know a little bit about churches. You know a lot about churches. Yeah, I'm, I'm serious. You've traveled past Rick enough to know the administration part. Not everybody can do that. The only time I ever learned it is when somebody quit on me, and I had to learn it. The I, I, only reason I learned to use a computer is because somebody quit on me. Amen. Then he came back to apologize. I said, too late. I know how to use it now. Yeah, I just took your salary and absorbed it into mine. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. That's really not true. I let him back in. Just didn't pay him as much. But Joshua Reyes, would you stand? Love, Josh. <laughs> i never forget the kindness of your mama, Josh. I had uh, my, my legs broke out. I, I fought that years ago, man, and my boots were bloody. I remember this. And your mother, was a, she worked in the medical field. And uh, took me and got me a shot and helped me out. I was there pe preaching Pastor Rick. Those are things you don't forget. It's those relationships and connections that are so important. Sister Lori, would you honor these guys? My wife is so, uh, so sweet. She makes sure that and if we'd known all of y'all coming, we'd got you something. I tell you what, on your way out, uh, somebody get back there, sure, I'll get them a mug, a T-shirt or something. Amen. Amen. Pastor Rick, that's your bucket. Amen. And we even got one here for Randy. But I want to make sure that all you guys, you, you want something, you stop back here and get it. All right? So thank you. I'll give my wife a hand. We appreciate what she does. On behalf of our staff, we're so honored to have all of you here tonight. And uh, you know, it's just regular Tuesday night service. They're not eating afterward or anything like that. I just wanted to do something special on first week, midweek. And, uh, of course, we had Doug Pittman in. We got uh, Pastor Rick tonight. Uh, my pastor, it looks like it's going to be coming in April, Pastor Mike Van Britsen. I'm very excited about having Pastor Mike. Got others that will be coming in, but uh, there's nothing needs to be much said about Pastor Rick and I. We go back 35-plus years. Uh, we've, we've rode with you guys, hung out with you guys, preached with you guys. And I've uh, been to South Africa with him, been to Jamaica with him. Um, everywhere I've ever been with him, I've seen the move of God. And I just kind of took up the scraps. Amen. I just got there to see whatever I can do. And uh, I've gleaned from him, stole from him. Uh, never gave the credit to him. Never won't. Never will. Amen. He pastors now in Norman, Oklahoma. Amen. A church called Quest Church, a growing church in that area. They're blowing and going. And uh, he's a pastor to pastors. Amen. So that's an amazing thing for people to be able to call him and him to instruct them and help them out through life. And by the way, I didn't mention this to the church, but Pastor Richard's retired now and is working in Oak Mulgee and other places with Native Americans. We're so proud of you, man. I 
so, so far you came. I mean, I remember back on Evanston and, the, and a van almost running over you. And that could have been the end of your ministry right there. Huh? It did run over. You didn't have the brakes on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indian learned something. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. I'll teach you uh, an old, old English word. It's called scotch. Yeah, scotch the tire next time. Amen. Would you welcome Pastor Rick Hawkins to the platform? Come on. Awesome. Awesome. All right. It's great to be with you guys, of course, and uh, what do you think about Pastor Jerry? The Bible says to give honor where honor is due, and um, we love Pastor Jerry. We go back quite a ways. 1984 is when we met. I drove up on to uh, International Bible College in a Chevette. It was a new Chevette, but it had been wrecked. And it had what looked like bullet holes in the front fender where they had drilled in there to pull the dents out. And I got out of the car and he was walking by and he stopped and he said, somebody shoot at you? <laughs> That's how we met. That was the beginning of a long lasting relationship. And uh, I was telling my brother Randy, who I'm honored is, of course, that he's with me tonight. But I was telling Randy, I said, the two the two greatest pastors that I've met in my life. I'm talking about pastors now. The real, true meaning of a pastor is uh, Pastor Ronnie Harrison in Norman, Oklahoma, and then Pastor Jerry Hovater. You, you, have, you have the premier pastor of pastors. So here's what I want you to do. I know he just turned 75 <laughs> the other day, right? He's, he's, uh, he just turned 60, but I want you to stand on your feet, and I want you to clap your hands and show some love for this man right here. He don't like it, but do it anyway. We love you, man. Lori. Love you, Lori. Um... There's some history right here with David and Richard. Richie walked in, and we were talking, and he was my buddy when I'd come and preach for Pastor Jerry and watch him play the drums and grow up. And I, I, I said, how old are you? That was a mistake. Because I thought he was going to say, you know, like 27, 40 years old. I said, never mind, just shut up. But Richie, Richie's with us tonight. I love these guys. This is some serious history right here. So it's an honor, of course, to be here with you guys. I only preached here about two times in the last what, 25 years or whatever it's been, maybe, maybe twice. But I appreciate you inviting me back, Pastor Jerry. Um, I just want to, you know, just kind of shift this thing in spiritual mode just for a moment, we don't mind, because we could be jovial all night, but that's not my assignment here. Uh, I just want to say something to you. I was talking to my pastor the other day, Pastor Dick Burnell, and he's been my pastor for quite some time now. And he told me, he said, you know, Rick, the first 30 years of our life we spend learning. And then the next 30 years, we spent earning. And then the, the next 30 years, which is the last 30 years, we spent turning and returning. Yeah. And as you've crossed over this wonderful threshold into the enjoyment of your life, you're going to begin to be blessed to do things you want to do and not things you have to do. Amen. And, that, and that's your life. You, you've, you've qualified for that. And, uh, man, you're in a wonderful, wonderful position, in that patriarchal position as a statesman. And I heard this as I was praying for you today in my hotel room. You have nothing to prove. You have nothing to prove. You've already done it. You've already shown this whole region you can build a huge church. You've shown them what a real pastor looks like. And I just really told, I really felt like the Lord told me that you're about to move from a season where, season where you've endured to a season where you're going to enjoy. Amen. Your best years are in front of you, yes. Pastor Jerry. Yes. So I just wanted to decree and declare that over your life, you know, and, and tell you how much I love your friendship. 
You've been a true brother to me. And uh, I appreciate that. God is good, isn't he? Isn't it been an interesting year? Hey, this time last year, <laughs> we were all shocked. Like, you can't go to church no more. <laughs> I was like, what? What happened? And you got to wear this mask around your face and, and stay in your house. And we were all just kind of blown away. Uh, maybe y'all weren't as shocked as me, but I was like, I, what, what just happened to the world? And I don't know about UHD, but I was thinking, you know, this will end in about three weeks. Did anybody else think like that? I thought, this will last a month. This will be over. And we'll be right back at it. And then two months happened. And I'm thinking, hold, hold on a minute. And then uh, somebody said, well, well, Pastor Rick, what did you do during this whole year, what we call the pandemic year, coronavirus, COVID-19 year? And I said, well, you know, I wrote a book and made a baby. <laughs> what, what are you going to do, you know? You're 59 and, you, and you're making babies? You better believe it. <laughs> I, I was thinking to myself, man, uh, you know, I, I will write this book. I got the book written, wrote about 18 songs, and then made a baby. And I, I look up, you know, a year later, and I'm thinking, thank God for Abbott, right? Stood, stood up today and, or, or yeah, yeah. sat down and said, you know, about one more week of this is all we're going to take. You know, the masks are coming off, and we're going back to work. Thank God for your governor. Now, now you, you got to pray for hours that he'll get the, he'll get the revelation. But uh, it's amazing this year. You know, if we started, everybody was preaching. Can I just relax with y'all tonight? Everybody was preaching uh, last year. Yeah. We get 2020 vision, boy. Everybody was preaching the year of the prophetic. And it went from prophetic to pathetic real quick. And, you know, it went from vision to virus like, like that, you know. And uh, I thought, wow, it didn't t turn out quite like we thought it would. And um, I think everybody stopped preaching on those numbers about years after last year. But we did re really was a year of vision because so much was exposed. Amen. So much was revealed, right? And I learned something that uh, in this pandemic that pressure did a lot of stuff to people. But, you know, when we team rope, it was always when you were on your final head, you know, and you, you got a rope under seven seconds and you backed in that head box. Every cowboy that's roping we use around that head box saying, hey, buddy, pressure will bust a pipe because they wanted you to miss. And uh, you felt that pressure. And I've watched so many guys just let that loop go right over the top of those horns because of the pressure. And I've learned something in this whole last year that pressure reveals the character of a man. You don't know what's in a man until pressure gets on him. And so what we did in this year is we've learned who people really were. Yes, sir. Pastors learned who were really with them, Miss Dolly. We learned who was really with us and wasn't with us. Do you realize the national average in church since this time last year? One third of the people have left their church and gone to another church. One third of the pre-COVID people um, have stayed with their church. And one third of people quit going to church at all. And the people who did stay with their church, if their churches were online, only watched once a month. So basically, it was kind of like one-third of the angels dropped out of heaven. And um, it was real, real prophetic to me. And I looked up, and we had about one-third of our church, you know. And now we're back up to about 55 or 60% of the people coming back. But it, it's been the toughest year for pastors I've ever seen. You know, before pre-COVID, you had 1,500 pastors resigning a month in this nation. Now you've got 3,000 a month resigning because they don't have the, the people. And if you don't have the people, you don't have the income. There's several guys with over 3,000 member churches that shut their churches down. Can you imagine that? Because they couldn't keep up with their uh, mortgages and had to sell their buildings. So I said all that to say, I didn't come to bring you bad news, come to bring you good news. I said all that to say, look at you. This is a Tuesday night. Are y'all with me right now? And you just walked right through this thing as a prototype, Pastor Jerry and, and your church. So we celebrate you and, and we honor you. God is good. Amen? Amen. All right, let's get into the word tonight. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. I'm only going to preach to 1035. 
and then we'll be out. No, I'm just kidding you. We're going we're gonna, to uh, just preach here a little bit. I'm going to talk to you about some things I learned during this season. And the Lord spoke to me during this season and said, those that are learners in this season will be leaders in the next season. Okay, I hope you didn't miss that. Those that were learners in this season will be leaders in the next season. And I felt the Lord speak to me as well these words. Stop teaching my people what to think and teach them how to think. Okay? And there's a big difference in that paradigm shift that we must uh, employ into our lives. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 Paul writes the church at Thessalonica and he says these words. Is this all right, Pastor Jerry? I just get into this like this. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. You got a clock? There it is right back there. 802. All right. Sanctify you wholly. And watch what he says. I pray God your whole spirit. What is, anybody know what the next word is? The next word in that verse is and. And soul. And body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you who also will do it. Everybody say this with me. He will do it. He will do it. Yeah. Now I want you to notice the triune characteristics of a man. He said, I pray that God will sanctify you wholly. And then he says, your spirit and your soul, and your body. When we started 2021, I, I looked back over the last year and I looked at myself. You know, it's always good to say, search me, oh God. Look at me. You know, it was a good time for us to look at ourselves. That's right. Right? Yeah. And I said, Lord, what has transpired in me in this season? And I heard God say this word, wholeness. Right. Say that word, wholeness. wholeness. See, wholeness is real important. God began to deal with me, and man, I really do feel an anointing in here tonight. This is really present. Thank you. So let me, let me just say to you this here now, that we have done a real good job of, as pastors of teaching our people how to be spiritual, right? But we've not really taught you the importance of that entity that's part of your trinity that is called your soul. And we've not taught people to take care of their soul. When Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? We've always looked at that verse asked to say, what does it profit a man if he has everything and ends up going to hell? That's not what that verse is saying. The Greek word soul that Jesus mentioned is the word suke, where you get the word psyche. So what he's saying is, what does it profit a man if you have all the material possessions in the world and you lose your mind? Come on, man. Yeah, that's right. Have you ever met rich people that are crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Howard Hughes, yeah. Yeah. right? You right. lose your mind. What does it profit a man? In other words, material possessions cannot bring you peace. Come on, sir. Yeah. So the Lord began to deal with me about taking care of your soul. And I'm going to give you some insight concerning that tonight. And it's very important. Um... In relationships, wholeness. Two half people don't make a whole person. Two half people don't make a whole person. It is unfair to bring fragmentation into a relationship with someone else and expect integration. Integration means whole. Integer is the root word of integration. It means complete or mature or whole. It is not fair to bring in immaturity to a relationship and expect a mature relationship. Right. Yeah. Oh, Lord God. Yeah. So here's what I saw happening and see happening. There's too many connections that have happened between people that were unhealthy to begin with. And the end result is a chaotic mess that is full of tension. Rick Hawkins, divorce 2007, very public divorce, media scandals, unbelievable stuff that 80% was total lies. But I'm not here to defend that. Here's the point I'm trying to make. It shattered my life into little bitty pieces. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you just 
force your way through that. Um, and then you finally just say, okay, I'm going to probably be single the rest of my life after being single for 14 years. And then you go onto a TV set that John Hagee's invited you to, and you're <laughs> after you've been divorced. That's a miracle in itself, y'all. And, and, and you're doing a thing on a woman caught in adultery uh, for TV, and you look down, and there's this beautiful Hispanic girl with these big brown eyes, and you forget your part. And I hadn't dated in a year and a half at that time. I know y'all think that's a, a miracle in itself, and that's true. But I looked down, and I, I thought, and they cut. You know, Pastor Rick, you all right? I said, let's run it one more time. And I go over to Dustin after we did, and I said, did you see the woman caught in the act of adultery, son? <laughs> he said, Dad, that girl's been in our church before. I said, did I ever meet her? And he said, yeah, she, you, you've met her before. I said, I don't, I don't know who she is. She's sitting over there. She was the main actor in this thing, you know, and I went over and sat next to her, and I said, hey, girl. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> she said, hey, Bishop. And then I shifted over to the, well, praise the Lord, sister. How are you? And, uh, and I told her, I said, I'm going to need your digits before we leave here. And um, she's 18 years younger than, than me. And, uh, man, can you believe that I've met the most perfect person in the world? I love my wife. And, and let me tell you, she's perfect match. Perfect match. Now, some of you are thinking, you are 59 years old, and you've got a two-month-old baby. Amen. Have you seen my wife? And she's just, a, she is sugar from her head to her feet. Well, I was telling Josh, I said, you know, something happened to me in that period of a year and a half that God really began to deal with my fragmentation and pull it all back together. And she saw something whole and she connected to it. Are you with me? She was whole and I connected to it. And we're the two most happy, happy people in the world. A perfect match is not a perfect catch. Come on, sir. You, you hearing what I'm telling you? It's not the perfect catch. It's the perfect match. And I'm thankful for that. But to be whole is to be without fragmentation. And I had no fragmentation. It means this. Put together properly. The quality of being complete. Not broken. Nothing broken. And nothing missing. Spiritually. Soulfully. Emotionally. And mentally sound. So I began to ask myself some questions. How did I know my soul was healthy? This is the stuff I wrote down. To me, soul health means, listen to this, dismantling harmful lies about ourselves and replacing them with the truth. Come on, sir. And you know what I had to do? I had to dismantle lies about myself. Because if you listen to your critics long enough, you begin to believe what they say than what God has said. A healthy soul will produce a desire for victory in life, but it will also show empathy, empathy for those who are dealing with defeat. I'll go through these quickly. A healthy soul does not attempt to control others through manipulation or entitlement. When someone's trying to control, it just means they're dealing with inner conflict. They're broken themselves. They feel like they're losing control. And if they can control the people and the environments around them, they feel safe. They feel like they've insulated themselves. A healthy soul doesn't manage emotions like anger or indignation. It masters them. It masters them. This is this stuff I wrote down that God dealt with me about during this season. A healthy soul follows the rule of the spirit and denies the un unhealthy appetites of the flesh. Right. Can you say amen to that? A healthy soul loves the green pastures of rest and restoration, and it recognizes and resists the chaotic atmospheres of tension that is caused by toxic relationships. A healthy soul immediately re recognizes this is going to be toxic. All right? I'll keep moving because I'm in a hurry here. According to Hebrews chapter 4, I'm going to show you something about your soul. The soul and the spirit are connected but they're separable. Read Hebrews chapter 4 and you're going to find that out. The word of God separates between soul and spirit. Your soul is the biggest part of you. 
that relates to life and other people. Your spirit is the biggest part of you that relates to eternity and God. Yes. Are y'all with me? Amen. Your soul relates to life and people. Your spirit relates to eternity and relates to God. That's what I'm telling you. We've been unbelievably successful at preaching and teaching the doctrine of the spirit. We have utterly failed at building the soul of people. That's why we're always in counseling. That's why we're always having to deal with divorce issues. That's why we're always trying to put stuff back together. Because here's what happens to us. We look at the body instead of the soul. We look at what we see instead of what we do not see. And I've been praying, God, open the eyes of your church. That we would be, he that winneth souls is wise. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? It takes wisdom to win the soul of a person. There's a difference in a soul tie and a soul mate. Soul mates can be two males. Look at Jonathan and David. The Bible says their soul was knit together as one. Two men. Boy, if we could ever understand the power of this way right here. That is just as powerful as this way right here. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Touch, and touch. No, don't touch nobody. I'm sorry. Just look at somebody and tell them, take care of your soul. Take care of your soul. So your soul carries purpose. Your spirit drives your purpose. Is this all right, Pastor Jerry? The spirit drives purpose. Your soul carries purpose. The spirit is the aspect of humanity that connects with God. The soul is the essence of, of humanity's being. It's who you are. When God created, Genesis 2, 7, from the dust of the earth, God created man, right? And he breathed into him. And what did he become? A living what? Soul. So the first expression of life in the earth was not spirit or body. The first expression of life in the earth was soul. Why? Because God knew immediately he was going to have to connect this man to another person. Yeah, yeah. Because it is not good for him to be alone. Yeah. So what did he do? He took from that body yeah. and made a woman and brought her to the man to see what the man would call her. And he had to be careful yeah. because whatever he called her, that was going to be the name of her, the name thereof, which means that's going to be her reference to him. So what did he say? Part of me. One man. Wombed man. Right. Now they can build a soul. They're not only soul mates. They can have a soul tie. If your spouse is hurting and you're not feeling it, somebody's unhealthy. So when God created man, the first expression of life was what? The soul. Which means your being, the essence of who you really are. God's gift to you in creation was you. Yeah. Woo. Come on. We'll say it again. God's gift to you in creation was you. What are you saying, Pastor Rick? He gave you you. Yeah. Yeah. Now you are going to determine what you become. Yeah. Your soul is your soil. What was man made from? Dust. And he became a living soul. Your soul is your soil. Every event, every experience, every encounter are seeds planted in your soul. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. You decide what's, what grows and you decide what goes. Yes. Somebody holler, amen. 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 You decide what grows. Yes. You decide what goes. Your soul is your soil. What did Adam, what was his assignment? Take care of what? The garden. Guard it. Protect it. You know what our responsibility is? Take care of our soil, our soul. Lord have mercy. Listen, you need to put a no trespassing sign on your soul. And tell the devil with all your distractions. What is a distraction, Pastor Rick? A distraction is an inappropriate attraction. If it wasn't attractive, you would have never looked at it. I'm going to say it again. A distraction is an inappropriate attraction. If it wasn't attractive, you wouldn't have looked at it. You got to put a no trespassing sign on your soul. Because let me tell you something. When you get your soul spread everywhere, 
This is why, I'm sorry. This is why David prayed. He said, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He what? Restores my what? Soul. Because you know what we do all day? We give little pieces of our soul to people that we're talking to. We can be talking to someone casually, casually, and they start sharing a concern with us, and you don't even know it, but your emotions, which is the seat, the, the soul is the seat of your emotions, is the activity of your will. When they're sharing with you, your soul is engaged. So you go away from them, they took part of your what? So when you lay down in green pastures, every night when I go to bed since I got this revelation, here's what I pray. God, restore my, return my soul to me. Because my soul was everywhere today. My emotions was everywhere today. My passions were everywhere today. So return my soul. Restore my soul before I go to sleep. You know what's going to happen tonight? Your soul's going to be restored. And you're going to start paying attention to this right here. You're going to start dealing with the soil of your being right here. And everybody that comes into your life, you're not just going to throw open doors. You're going to cautiously approach every situation. Yeah. Are y'all with me? Yes, Ooh, good God, have mercy. This is good stuff here. Amen. 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 Look at somebody and tell them I'm a soul person. That's what I am. That's right. All right. Pastor Jerry, how long do y'all go? 8.30? No, seriously. How long? Tuesday nights, how long do y'all stay here? Be, somebody tell me the truth. Oh, y'all not here on Tuesday nights? Oh, wow. I thought y'all had every Tuesday night service here. I'm sorry. So I can go till 10. Okay, once a month. I heard you. Well, I'm going to keep going. All right. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to bring some meat to these bones. All right. Is that all right with y'all? Let's bring some meat to these bones. All right. I'll go fast. But I just want God to deal with us tonight. Because I, Pastor Jerry, I'm going to just say it one more time. We got this here wrong, y'all. We have, we've not taught you as pastors. When's the last time you heard somebody preach on your soul? People don't do it. They avoid it. They ignore it. Why? Anything something is ignored in life is because of the avoidance of responsibility. And you know what? Responsibility requires discipline. And Christians are very undisciplined people. We are. So we need to get back. We need to get back to paying attention to what really matters. Amen? Amen. Even God himself expressed himself in pluralism. He's the Father. He's the Son. He's the Holy Spirit. He's God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. Somebody asked me, are, 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 is God Trinity or is he one? I said, well, have you ever looked at an egg? Separate that. And that's God. He's God the shell, God the white, and God the yellow. Right? But here's the bigger question. What difference does it make? It ain't never saved nobody. It ain't never saved anybody. And so, but here, the point of him telling us that, well, he says there's three that bear witness in heaven. There's three that bear witness in earth. It's because we have to deal with this triune existence all the time. And your soul wants to mediate between your body and your spirit. Come on, sir. And if you're not spirit led, your soul will gravitate to your flesh. Amen. Your flesh will get in trouble. Your soul is crushed and your spirit is interceding. Yeah. Woo. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's good. That's right. When I don't know how to pray as I ought, the spirit makes intercession for me according to the will of God. Because your, if your flesh is leading you and your soul is following it, devastation is on the way. And the only thing that's going to repair it is the spirit. Second Samuel 9. Then David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I can show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? There's that soul tie. Now there, were, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they summoned him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am. I am your servant. Then the king said, is there no one remaining of the house of Saul to whom I could show kindness, the kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, listen carefully what he said. There is still a son of Jonathan who was disabled in his feet. So the king said to him, where is he yet? 
And Ziba said unto him, he's in, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. You've heard people preach from this, right? And they sent messages to him and brought him to the house of Maker, the son of Amiel um, from Lodabar. Mephibosheth, that's the first time you've heard his name now. We done read five verses and we not heard this man's name. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face, prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, here is your servant. Then David said to him, do not be afraid. Yeah, come on. Listen to that. For I will assuredly show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. All right. And I will restore to you the land of your grandfather, Saul. And you yourself shall eat at my table regularly. Come on, sir. And he fell down and said, what is your servant that you should be concerned about a dead dog like me? I'm going to hit these very quick. Everyone say these with me. His name. His, name. his, shame. his shame. His fame. His fame. All right. Real simple. Now watch this. When David inquired of Ziba. Is there anyone from my brother's house, my soulmate and my soul tie, yeah. that is left that I can show kindness to? Watch what Ziba says. He said, it, there is a son, but he's crippled in both of his feet. David asks, is there anyone left? And he says, a son that is lame. Watch what I'm telling you. He called him by his condition, not by his character. Come on. Be careful of so-called friends that when they refer to you to other people, you remember Rick, the divorce guy. That is not your friend. Or, well, you know, Rick, you know, he went through all. Why can't you? Why, why do you have to refer to the man's condition? Instead of just refer to his character. Here's why. Because Ziba was the servant of Saul. Saul is dead. Which meant Ziba was in control of Saul's inheritance. There are people called opportunists. That will capitalize on your condition. Come on sir. They are waiting for you to slip. So that they can capitalize on your condi condition. Ziba was threatened by Mephibosheth. Yeah. Lord have mercy. Watch what he says. He has a son. But he is crippled. In other words. You don't want him. He's useless. You know what this is called? Labeling. When, what is labeling? It's when you give yourself. Or you allow others to give you a label or a name as though a single word describes you completely. Yeah. Come on, sir. What are you saying, Pastor Rick? I'm going to tell you real simple. Never allow what you have done to define who you are. Amen. Say it again, Pastor Rick. Never allow what you've done to define who you are. What you have done can bring labels. Hebrews chapter 11 still calls Rahab the prostitute. Read it for yourself. She's in the hall of faith called Rahab the prostitute. You know why? Because some people will never let you out of that chapter of that book. To them, that chapter of your life is your whole life. And if you stay in that chapter, you will be who they said you are. Never let a chapter of your life define your whole book. Are y'all hearing what I'm telling you? And if people want to keep reading that chapter of your life over and over and over, buy them a bag of popcorn, get them a Coke, and say, enjoy yourself. But the next time you see the real me, you're going to see somebody restored, revived, refreshed, and living in the perfect, powerful will of God. So if you enjoy that part of my life, just keep living it. I'm gone. In Louisiana, we say gone, pick home. <laughs> All right. So how did he wind up in this condition, Mephibosheth? Here's what happened. Verse 4, chapter 4, 2 Samuel. There's an attack on Saul's house. I won't read it all. There's a nurse there that is taking care of Mephibosheth. 
She jumps up, takes off running. Mephibosheth is five years old. And the Bible says in verse 4, two words. He fell and became lame. Pastor David, preach this, please. You preachers, preach this, please. He, Pastor Mondo, preach this, please. He fell and became lame. Boy, when I saw that, them two words jumped off that page and right into my, he fell. And then the next words, and became lame. Have you ever, anybody in here ever fallen? Come on, sir. Yes, sir. I, thought, I thought maybe, I knew Mickey, me and Mickey, yeah. Yeah, it's called losing face. That's how you feel. But to other people, it's a lost future. You know what I say to hell with other people? They're jackasses. Feels so good to be able to say that in our church. Jackass, jackass, jackass. I'm just glad I can say that and people are cool with it. Can I say that two more times? Just jackass, jackass. Thank, thank you for that. I appreciate that. We've all fallen, but here's the next question. Have you ever fallen so hard that it crippled you? See, that's a bigger question. It's one thing to fall. It's another thing to fall to the point that it cripples you. Now, there's a few of us that have been through that. We fall into the place that it crippled us. See, when you're crippled, you can still move. You just can't move as fast. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. He forgot one line. They shall also crawl. Because when you're lame, you crawl. Have you ever crawled your way out of a situation? Come on, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, basically, you come to some seasons in life where you can't soar like an eagle. You're surely not running like an athlete. You barely can walk. But you can crawl. And if you can crawl, you can get out of it. See, it don't stop you. It just slows you down. You know you're going to get there. But you're not going to get there as fast as you would have if you had not fallen. Hmm. I never doubted one time in my life. I'm going to get there, Richie. I'm going to get there. I might crawl. But y'all have highly underestimated my commitment to Christ. You crazy as hell if you think I'm going to stop serving the Lord. I'm just telling you. I'm going to get there. Now, I might crawl, but I'm going to get there. Come on. Come on. Are y'all with me there? And so here's the deal. (laughs) You had to crawl. But the Bible mentions this nurse. Now this changes some things. Did she drop that boy? Was she running and dropped him and fell on him and crippled him? What are you saying, Pastor? Have you ever been so disappointed in leadership that it crippled you? You didn't fall, they did. And their fall slowed you down. Making sense? Have you ever been that disappointed? Yeah. Your fall didn't cripple you. He fell and he slowed you down. Hmm. Still don't know his name. Still don't know. We ain't even got to his name yet. We just know a guy's crippled because somebody fell. That's all we know. We don't know the boy's name yet. When you get to verse 4, David says, where is he? He's still trying to find out what the boy's name is. Yeah. And Ziba said he's at this house and the son of Amiel, maker in Lodabar. And verse 6, we finally find out who he is. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down. Many preachers preach this message and they call it Mephibosheth means shame. Mephibosheth don't mean shame. Mephibosheth means the dispeller of shame. That's right. Come on, In other words, I have been shamed and I shame shame. Mm. Come on. 
Suddenly we've arrived at a place in our nation where everything's about less. Be less man. Be less of a man. You don't be that much of a man. Put a little swing in your hips and don't you be less, be less man. Be be less white. Be less Republican. Be less conservative. Be less. You know what that's called? You know what that's called? Shame. But, and if we keep going that way before long, you're going to walk into a building and you're going to be ashamed because you're white. Right, come on. Yeah. 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 That's right. You can walk in and, oh, there's a white guy. Let me help all y'all. I'm not that dude at Sonny. <laughs> and them two white boys right there, they, don't, they, they not me. You want cream on your, you want nuts on your ice cream? <laughs> yeah. Can we get nuts on our ice cream? <laughs> Every time them white boys come on, I just look at that and say, I am not you. I don't go to Sonic with my buddy and ask him, would you like nuts on your ice cream? <laughs> Are y'all with me right now? Boy, it feels good to be able to preach like this in a church, son. Jackasses. Jackasses. <laughs> yeah. See, here's the deal. They want, they want you to feel guilty. Did you hear what I said? Don't miss that now. They want you to feel guilty about something you had nothing to do with. If you think this boy from Baton Rouge, Louisiana is going to ever become less than a white dude that loves all people, there had nobody stood up for integration that I know of that carries this color skin more than this guy. I preached at the Martin Luther King Jr. March every year, 250,000 people. You're going you gonna to try to convince me I'm racist? You've lost your... Mine, <laughs> jackass. Uh, I won't say it anymore, Pastor. <laughs> See, there's a difference in guilt and shame. They want you to feel guilty. Guilty is a feeling of wrongdoing. What I did is not good. That's associated with behavior, though. What I did was wrong. But shame is a feeling of worthlessness. I'm no good. That's, that's not behavior, that's being. That's not what I did is wrong. Who I am is wrong. Shh. That's where this society is going. Who I am is wrong. Are y'all with me right now? Don't accept it. Hmm. This relates to the essence of the person. Shame, say it with me, is the enemy of your soul. Let's say it loud. Come on. Shame is the enemy of your soul. One more time. Come on. Shame is the enemy of your soul. You say, Pastor Rick, how you know Mephibosheth was suffering from shame? Look at chapter 9, verse 8. Mephibosheth, first words to David is, who am I that you would pay attention to a stray dog like me? Yeah. Somebody told him he was a dog. He believed it. If you believe what they say, then you are what you believe. Yeah. Where was he living? In Lodabar, which means no pasture. Can't find rest and you can't find restoration. Why? Because there's no communication. There's no word. That's what Lodabar means. Right. No communication, no word. Have you ever been through something so bad you can't talk about it? Come on, Come on now. Yes, sir. That's Lodabar. When you've been through something so bad, you can't talk about it. Yeah. Hmm. I love what David says when he meets him in verse 7. Don't start singing yet, brother. Hold on, man. I'm almost done. I, I drove a long way to get here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, I knew y'all was lying a while ago. I asked y'all how long we got. Oh, preach all night. Yeah. And then he's going to come up here and get the guitar. Be still, bud. Just be still. I ain't done. <laughs> you won't stand there a while. Just go ahead. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this. He said, don't be ashamed. Watch what David tells Mephibosheth. Everyone say fame. fame. Now here's fame right here. He said, don't be ashamed. I'm going to show you kindness because I love your daddy. Yeah. 
Y'all just missed that. I'm going to show you kindness because I love your daddy. That's strong, y'all. And I'm going to restore to you what belonged to your grandfather. This is a guy that tried to kill David. He tried to shame David. And he said, I'm going to give you everything that belonged to him. It's one thing that God has pitted himself against. I want you to hear me clear. There's one thing that God is dead set against. You know what it is? Shame. Shame. Hmm. You know what Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter number 14 and verse number 19 says? At that time, I'm going to undo everything that afflicted you. I'm going to save you that halteth, that is lame. And I'm going to gather her that was driven out because of shame. Watch what he says. And I'm going to get you praise and fame in every land where they have put you to shame. Boy, that's powerful. I'm going to get you praise and fame in every place they put you to shame. In other words, they're going to have to watch your comeback. They're going to have to be embarrassed. They're going to feel what they put you through. Good God, have mercy. Just wink, smile, and keep on loving them. You understand what I mean? Love them, but don't you never trust them. You get a chance with my trust one time. You'll have my love forever. But let me find you talked about me. I'll never trust you. I'll love you till we die. But I will not believe you will not do it again. Is that too heavy for you? No, it's good. Good. Now watch this here. <laughs> I'm about done. Fame isn't popularity. It isn't celebrity status. It's God saying, I'm going to give you your honor, honor back. I'm going to give you dignity back. I'm going to give you character back. My God, I want to run around this building right here. I'm going to give your honor back, your dignity back, your character back, and they're going to have to watch it. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'm going to close this because I'll preach all night. Watch what he says. He said, I'm going to restore everything back to you that was stole from you because you thought you was a dog. Because when you live in shame, stuff that belongs to you begins to wander away from you. It was really, you know why it wanders away from you? Not because it wasn't yours, but because you feel like you don't deserve it. You know what I started believing? I don't deserve to have a good wife. You know why? Because I read too much on media. I watched too many news reports to the point I thought I'll never have a good wife and I don't deserve to have a good wife until one day God said, let me tell you something, son. Your best days ain't behind you. Your best days are in front of you. Boy, and I, th I, th I look at my wife and cry my eyes out. I look at my baby. I weep over my baby. You know why? Because God gave me a start over. And he said, Rick Hawkins, you're going to get it all back. All of it. A good wife. A beautiful, beautiful child. I'll never forget the day Jovanna called me. She said, can we meet for lunch? I wonder where she was crying. She pulled out that little white stick. I said, what the? <laughs> she said, baby, I'm pregnant. Wow. And she was bawling. She's 41 years old, never had a child, never been married. Never been married. Can you believe that beautiful girl? Never been married, never had a child. You know why? Because God saved her for old Ricky D. <laughs> oh, yeah, he saved her just for me, son. I walk in there, son, listen, when I walk around with her, she's my trophy. Boy, I just put her right there. Right. I just shove her right out there. Say, look, look at here what God has done. God is good. And watch what David told my pibber chef. You're going to eat at my table as much as you want to. You know why, y'all? Because when we at the table, what happens? We all look alike. You can't see his crippledness when he's at the table. You can't see his lameness when he's at the table. You know what I came by to tell you? Get back to the table. Amen. Just pull up there and get you a fork and get you a plate. And when they start serving, just reach in there like you deserve it. 
just cut you a big old piece off that roast and say, man, I deserve to sit right here. Why? Because Jesus Christ hung on a cross. He bled for my sins. He cleansed me. Not one time. So many times has he cleansed us from our iniquity. Every time you've confessed, he's cleansed. And you're going you're gonna to act unworthy and shameful. Somebody shout, I'm not ashamed. Let's stand on our feet and give the King of Kings and Lord of Lords a good praise, shall we? Come on, y'all. Let's praise him real good. Hallelujah. God is good. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to... I'm going to ask you to lift your hands, please, everybody. Father, we lift our hands towards you. And Father, I'm going to ask you right now just to breathe. Exhale in this place. Let the wind of your spirit just blow through here. Let these people feel your affirmation. Man, I keep hearing these words. Search for significance while I'm praying. Search for significance. Quit performing and start enjoying the pleasure of God. He's pleased with you. Behold, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Say this with me, Father. Thank you that I please you. You're not mad at me. You did not send your son to kill me. You sent your son that I could have life and life more abundantly in jesus name say this with me it's good to be at the table even in the presence of my enemies let's clap our hands one more time and give him praise Amen. Guys, you be seated real quick. Pastor Rick, before you, before you sit down, what is, uh, what's on that table back there? Yeah, come in and just tell everybody. Because you, you wrote a book and, and had a baby. There you go. And that's what's back there. Not the baby, but the book. <laughs> um, River Ricky, you can see him on Facebook, but you can find that book on the table back there and we usually sell these books for fifteen dollars what is it's 21 days of building a blessed life and uh i'm telling you 21 days of doing something will help you even if you steal it you can it'll bless you (laughs) that's my gift to you pastor but they're back there and uh somebody asked me you know would you sign our book tonight i don't want to i just don't feel like doing it that all right I love y'all. If you send it to me, I'll sign it and mail it back to you. I just don't, I want to hang out with him. All right. Is that all right with y'all? But anyway, they're back there and there's other books, I think, back there, other stuff. All right. Uh, uh, You buy the book, I'll sign it Sunday. (laughs) All right. But I need you to sign something right now. I need you to sign a check or look at somebody and say, I need to borrow, I need to borrow money. I'm not going to give back or whatever. I just need you to give a good offering tonight. Amen. We only have two nights with Pastor Rick. He is not preaching this tomorrow night. So feel blessed you got here tonight. Amen. He's going to preach something else tomorrow. There's more. He's going to preach tomorrow night. There's more. Is that the sermon or is, or is there more to this? Oh, oh, the whole message. Whole different message. Amen. I know that. I know his brother got some sermons. Uh, if you need to offer an envelope, they're right in front of you. Amen. In the pews here. Amen. If you're sitting on the front row, just reach behind you and somebody will give you money and an envelope. Everybody be a giver tonight. If you give your tithe, just put tithe. Anything else, we're going to go to Pastor Rick. Make sure we bless him. Amen. I thank God for the ministry that's in this house. It is a lot of history. I wish I had more time to spend with these guys. Uh, Real fast, some of you know Johnny Clark. Johnny was a friend, uh, is a friend of mine. uh, In a Mike Easterlin and Johnny worked together. Johnny parked cars out at the other campus. Johnny was a huge part back in the beginning of the little country church. And uh, Mike had an epiphany to go by and see him and went by and saw him and he was almost dead. He couldn't hardly breathe. He was gasping. 
uh, he was sitting in his truck trying to get, get to the hospital, they believe, and Mike called me crying. He said, Pastor, what do I do? And I said, you got to call 911. you got to get an ambulance. And they came and picked him up. I say that to tell you to pray for him. Amen. Keep praying for him as we've been praying for uh, other people. Just because we hadn't seen him in church in a while don't mean we don't love him. Amen. So I love Johnny Clark. So pray for him. I'm doing a, a funeral Sunday at 2 o'clock of a 23-year-old young man who died in the woods during the cold. Now, I mean, you know, our lives are going on, but other people are still, they got struggles. Since my friend Penny Brown, some of you remember Kent and Penny Brown. Kent Brown was a worship leader for, for me back in the early stages of our ministry at uh, Crosby here in uh, Kent, Pat, sir. An old blue block building. I, I, I'll go one further. The old Crosby Motel. Yeah, he was at the motel and then the blue block building. And uh, Kent passed away today. Uh, Mid-50s. Pneumonia. And, uh, you know, we need to pray for Penny. He's pastor of Covenant uh, Church in uh, Liberty, Texas. Amen. Strong prophetic anointing. So these are things, you know, as, as much as I, you know, you you got to keep pressing through life. you got to keep right on going. Uh, and by the way, my God, what a word. Was that good? I mean, seriously. I stole the notes of that message. I already have it on my iPad. And, and uh, I love the story of the soul. The soul is an amazing thing to, to, have, you, to have somebody. And, and, you know, like you and you mentioned soulmates. Pastor Rick and I have been soulmates since I, somebody shot the front end of his Chevette. <laughs> Amen. And uh, you too, Randy. I mean, that's all you guys. I mean, I just, I love the, I love, I mean, the, you know, Richard was with me at several places when I preached uh, out of the country. Amen. I can't tell you how many times me and him missed an airplane because he wanted another cup of coffee. Well, it wasn't you, was it? It was, it was me. Okay. I'm a relaxed brother in another country now. I just chill out. Josiah, to the band, y'all sound so good tonight. I mean that, you know, and it's not trying to flatter you or anything. I just, uh, I know God brought you in for this time. Amen. We're praying for you. Amen. Take that mask off so I can hear you. Yeah. Amen. 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 And look at you. You're still here. God's got you, sis. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. For those of you that are traveling from here to there, give yourself some time. Amen. As a matter of fact, you go. I wouldn't go the Beltway home from here, Jimmy. No, 59 shut down. Yeah, so I'm just giving you a heads up. It'll be a little bit, probably a little clearer to going back this way. So coming here was easy. But going back, 59 shut down. And by this time, everybody ought to be off the road near home. So going back toward would be good, better to go down 1485. Pastor Rick, uh, you guys, we're going to pass the buckets. And after that, we'll pray and you can go. Come on, let's pass them buckets. I like saying this. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Amen. Last bucket pass. You can go. Love you guys. See you tomorrow night, 7 o'clock.